Szóval akkor folytatjuk az Oszkedészk konferenciát. Amit fontos tudnotok, hogy alapvetően ez az egész kezdeményezés abból indult ki, hogy egy ilyen alkalomnál valamit csináljunk, tehát egy ilyen hekaton jelleggel valamit úgy proaktívan el is készítsünk. Itt mi arra gondoltunk, hogy első körben így a figyelmet kellene felhívni és konferencia formában megvalósítani, viszont a jövőben szeretnénk olyan, olyan rendezvényeket létrehozni, ahol ö, több lehetőség van a párbeszédre, valaminek az elkészítésére, experimentálására. Ennek igazából ö, egy kis ízelítője, például itt a robotika pult, ahol kellett próbálni a virtuális ö, valóságot és az egyéb ö, robot kütyüket. Úgyhogy ö, kövessétek mindenképpen az Envientának, főleg a Facebook ö, megjelenéseit, ugyanis ott tudtok majd értesülni az elkövetkezendő eseményekről. Most pedig megyünk tovább, és a nem növekedés vonal az egy érdekes téma volt abból a szempontból, hogy úgy lehet, hogy nagyon megmozgatta a jelenlévők fantáziáját, és erről fogunk hallani Vincent Lizsétől, aki a nem növekedés egyik nagy szószólója, és arról fog beszélni, hogy mi várható ettől a trendtől, a, ennek a trendnek a pártolói mit vázolnak föl, mi várható a jövőben. Ez egy angol nyelvű rész lesz. A végén a kérdés válaszból, hogy ha erre szükség van, akkor segítek a fordítással. Úgyhogy fogadjátok Vincentet is nagy szeretettel. Köszönöm szépen. Nagyon bocsánat, egy kicsit beszélek magyarul, de nem elég átcsinálni egy, egy előadás, akkor beszélek angolul, és szerintem, hogy jó lesz mindenkinek. Uh, so my name is Vincent Yeger, I'm very glad to be here today. And uh, following the discussion in the morning, I decided to change a bit the plan of my presentation. That's why I will uh, first start with an introduction, uh, which is a short presentation. It's going to be not, no more than uh, three minutes. It will be about, more about, uh, I will try to talk to the rational part of your brain. In the second time, I will speak to the irrational, rational part of your brain. And finally, I will go to what I plan to speak about today, more about the solution, starting from an experimentation what we launched in Budapest called Cargonomia. So first, let's speak a bit about uh, the rational part of our brain. I would like to come back to some facts, some order of magnitude to realize where we are nowadays, to realize in particular where we are from the point of view of the physical limits to growth from the point of view of energy. So I go with the first slide. It's something most of you, I guess, already saw, already uh, uh, le learned about. So this is a map with a small modification. The size of each country depends not on the superficie of the country, but depends on the environmental footprint of the, part of, of the country. So we can see that there are very, very radical inequalities. If you take uh, North America, for example, when you have an environmental footprint, about six, seven planets. Europe is more or less the same, with four planets. Which means that if everybody was following the same way of consumption, of production, of life, than Europeans or Americans, we will need to support this way of life four planets, even more. The second slide is about one energy consumption, history. I could have gone much, 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 much further. I started in the beginning of the first industrial revolution. But if you go thousands or tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of years before, you will find more or less the same amount of consumption of energy. And it started to exponentially increase in the middle of the last century particularly depending on one type of resource, which is fossil energy. If you see this graph, which is about the world primary energy consumption in 2014, and you add together natural gas, coal, and oil, you see that it represents more than 80% of the energy we are depending on, which means that all our everyday life is depending on what is, in fact, solar energy, accumulated on Earth on millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. So here you see prediction about uh, the fossil energy production 
and about how we will reach a peak of production. So we are somehow close to the peak. Uh, some people think that we reach the peak of production of oil, of conventional oil in 2006. And we have to understand that in a few generations, we burnt a limited reserve of accumulated energy coming from solar energy in hundreds of millions of years. And now we are reaching these points where we are reaching the limits, the limits to growth, the limits to the consumption of fossil energy, what we are totally depending on. And again, it represents more than 80% of the energy that we consume every day. Here you have a graph about the oil discovery in the last years and the prediction. And you can see that since the 1980, we never went as far in discovering new f f oil reserves and everything. So we are really starting to reach the point that we don't discover new oils. We burnt a big part, moreover the part which was the easiest w w one to produce, to extract, and now we have less and less and less oil, and also more and more and more difficult type of oil or fossil energy to extract. Here is what we call the myth of decoupling. We often hear from economics that it's not a problem that we are reaching the physical limits to growth because we can create a new type of economy in dematerializing economy. And in fact, we keep speaking about it for decades. And if you look at this graph, you can see how, from the point of view of the world, economic growth is totally directly connected to energy consumption. And again, energy consumption is fossil energy behind. It could work only in a country if you don't calculate externalities. Like, for example, economic growth increased in some countries with the decrease of fossil energy consumption or with a decrease of environmental footprint. But it was a lie because it was only to substitute or to deplace for this environmental footprint to another part of the world. And now I would like to go back to something very important, the myth of renewable energy. May I ask you first a question, what is the energy which is the most efficient, the greenest, the most renewable, the cleanest? Which energy is it? That's the one we don't consume. And here you have in the middle of the picture what you can see in advertisement about smart energy, renewable energy, green energy. And we don't see what is behind, because behind every energy that we produce, there is something. Uh, I used to be an engineer, and I remember I was told that, as an engineer, you don't make an omelet without breaking eggs. And very often, and I saw a, a video during the lunchtime showing nice picture about renewable energy, everything is green, everything is happy, everything is working very well, and so on. But it's a big lie, because between each cell that we put in a smart building, in a smart city, behind each solar panel, wind tower, you have what you see around in the picture. You have to extract raw materials, you have to extract metals. And I spoke about the physical limits of exploitation of fossil energy. You have the same with metals. We have a limited stock of metal from copper to uh, rare earths, where we are totally depending on to make smart machines, to make smart buildings, to make smart cities and everything. So behind what we call smart, there is a physical reality. In particular, I think about rare earths, there is this physical reality that it's coming mostly from one city in China with a lot of incredible disasters. And we never see, we never face this type of things. Degrowth, I started to be interested in degrowth, and degrowth was um, very influenced by this uh, thinking about the physical limits to growth, in particular, uh, uh, an economist coming from Romania who made his career partly in the uh, United States with Schumpeter and finally in Vanderbilt University. And in the 19, late 1960s, he wrote a very fundamental academic article which has been ignored since then, which is called The Entropy Law and the Economic Process. And behind every process of economy, behind every process of transformation, there is entropy. Entropy, it means that you destroy the quality of material, energy, what you have. If you burn one liter of coal, at the end you have the same level of energy. 
but you don't have coal anymore. You cannot use it anymore. If you use copper to make a solar panel, and after 20 years your copper gets entropy and is not effective anymore, you still have the same level of energy, but you cannot use anymore this copper. It's lost. And it's the same with uh, a circular economy. And I, 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 don't put, I didn't put it here, but you have a nice poster for this day. When you see a circle, you put something, it's turning, and, and everybody is happy. And it's a big lie. You can recycle something, but you cannot recycle everything. You always have to put more energy to recycle. And it's even more difficult if you go with high technology. If you take a smartphone, it's a big lie to believe that you can recycle a smartphone because you use such a small quantity of material that it will cost so much energy to re-extract it and reuse it after. And that's why with degrowth, we open discussion, debate, thinking from a technological point of view about low tech, low technology, type of technologies which are more or less recyclable. Small technologies on which you can have a control, a democratic control. Small technologies which are not relying on a type of material which requires a lot of energy to extract, which are relying not on a type of processes of fabrication, which are not relying, relying on a lot of energy or water or whatsoever to be produced. So I arrive to the second part of my uh, presentation. I'm sorry, it's in French. I'm already speaking in English, and I put something in French. There was a survey made one year ago in four Europe, Western European countries, Italy, Spain, France, and uh, Germany. And people were asked, in which utopia do you believe in? Uh, there were people representing the diversity of, the, of each society and everything, and we got a surprise explaining what is behind degrowth, what is behind collaborative economy, what is behind transhumanism. We got a surprise to see that the majority, not the majority, but the first answer, 47% of the people, was degrowth. The second one was collabor collaborative economy, and the third one, transhumanism. So I would like to go to the second part of my presentation with that transition, which is about the fact that even if infinite growth on a finite planet will be possible, I think we should question whether it makes sense, whether it makes us happier to always grow, to always produce more technologies, more sophisticated technologies and everything. I spoke about environmental footprint. We have an environmental footprint in Europe around three, four planets. Are we three times, four times happier than we were in the time when we have an environmental footprint which was lower than uh, one planet, which was in the 1960s? Are we something like 400 times happier than people living in Burkina Faso? Have you already been in Burkina Faso? I have a friend who travels there and he says that after a few days he had uh, muscle aches because he was not used to smile and smile so much in everyday life and everything. So it's a provocation, of course, but it's much more complex. I would like also to invite you to question yourself about what we call the Estonian paradox. Is always more, always more technologies, always more material, always more growth and so on, directly connected to always more subjective happiness. Studies, a lot of studies, in particular Sterling, who studied so, show that it's connected till you reach a certain level of decent life. You fulfill the basic needs. But above this level, which is the most important for your well-being, it's not growth, it's not always more. Another example, which is quite interesting, it's uh, coming from Ivan Ilyich, who was a sociologist, and it's connected to what we call the counterproductivity of development. And Ivan Ilyich understood that when you have a new technology, technique, an institution, an economic system or whatsoever, and it starts to develop, start to grow, sooner or later you reach a level where it becomes counterproductive. A good example, it's a study he made in the 1970s in the United States where he calculated the average speed of a car. If you also include in your calculation the time you have to, to work to finance your car and finance the infrastructure for the car. And he found that the average speed of a car in the 1970s is 5 km per hour, as quick as to go on foot. Which doesn't mean that the, oh, we have to burn all the car, but which means that we have to rethink the way we depend on car and to get rid of the situation that I need a car to go to work and I have a car to go to work and it's turning around and everything. Another idea coming from the story from the car which deconstructs uh, the rationality of our irrationality on the contrary 
It's in Paris, on a big highway around the city. Years ago, there were debates to reduce the average speed on that highway, when it's always blocked in traffic jam. And everybody was against it, saying that if you reduce the speed limit, it's going to reduce the average speed. And in fact, what's happened is exactly the contrary. We limited, limited the, average, the, limit, the speed limit from 90 to 70, and the average speed increased for 30%. Another point I would like to share with you is what we call the Jivan paradox, the rebound effects. Very often, when we face a problem, we think that we need a technological solution. We have traffic jam, let's construct a more efficient car, let's construct smart system, let's construct uh, one more lane on the highway, let's construct more highways and everything. And history has shown to us in the last decade that when you construct a more effective car to reduce environmental impact on this car, it turns out that you increase the services given by the car. Cars are more effective, we installed air condition on the car. Cars were more effective, were cheaper, so more people started to buy cars. And the global, one car you increase the efficiency, but the global effect was that you decrease the efficiency and increase the environmental impact of the things. And the last point I want to conclude Degrowth is inviting us to reevaluate everything. And uh, I remember in the morning, Sandra showed a picture with uh, three layers economy, uh, human being, and environment. And I would add one fourth layer, which would be technology, which would be even more insights. And very often we put technology first without questioning for what, how, and for what kind of purposes. And degrowth is inviting us to reevaluate what do we produce how, for what kind of purposes. So I arrive to the last part of my, uh, of my presentation and I will go now with, uh, with a video of an experimentation what we launched in Budapest. And I will uh, reflect a bit on that from a degrowth perspective and what kind of solution I implemented. friends in Budapest involved in different activities dealing with sustainability and more social justice. We met and decided to launch an ambitious project for better well-being called Cargonomia. We would like to distribute healthy local food in Budapest with our self-manufactured cargo bikes. We get vegetables from our partner Jamboki Biokert. Jamboki Biokert is a 4 hectare organic and biodynamic vegetable garden in the village of Jambok. High quality vegetables are produced for families in Budapest and they distribute it in weekly through their weekly box delivery system. Jambok is also an open farm which regularly welcomes students and gardeners who want to learn more about environmentally conscious vegetable production. enjoy these vegetables, we would like to add bread from our bakery partner, Pipatch Bake Shake. Pipatch is a social cooperative created one year ago. They make organic bread using traditional wet varieties. Their bread will be delivered with our cargo bikes all around the city. We bring all that food and also eggs, beers to Cargonomia in the city center of Budapest. From there, we distribute it to people in Budapest with our cargo bikes made in Cyclonomia. Cyclonomia is a social cooperative with 300 members. It is a do-it-yourself bike shop where people can repair their bike while learning and helping each other. Cyclonomia also hosts community events focusing on sustainable transport, in particular with children. It is also an open space for convivial and cultural activities. These cargo bikes are used by our messenger partners from Kanta. Kanta is a self-managed company organizing the logistic and coordinating the distributions. Cargonomia bike delivery service and multifunctional community center helps local producers to directly reach consumers. 
to keep going, we need your support to finance new cargo bikes which will be constructed in Cyclonomia. We need your support for communication to create new communities receiving our vegetable and bread. We also need your support to establish functional space. Thanks for supporting Cargonomia's project. So it's just one example of uh, what a friend in a book called One Million of a Peaceful Transformation of the Society. And uh, if you travel all around the world, you can find a lot of initiatives like that one. People who try more or less outside of the logic of the system, more or less outside of the economic model we are sticked on, who try to reinvent new ways to produce, to exchange, to uh, meet with each other, and to take decisions in a more democratic way. And with Cargonomia, what we try to do, it's on a very low scale, to experiment new ways of life and also to invent and learn how to reappropriate the tools what we use. And we are really uh, driven by the question of low tech. That's why we, we work with uh, a low tech local farm, working with horses and low tech tools and, and uh, very smart, not like the smart cities, but very smart uh, techniques to uh, get rid of fertilizers and, and chemicals and uh, pesticides and this type of things. And um, you can get a very high level of productivity, much higher than uh, conventional farming, because on one hectare we are able to feed 300 families with six people working full time on the farm. Also, we try to reappropriate tools for transport. And we realize that we can construct ourselves cargo bikes, trailers, type of low tech transport system where we can transport almost everything that is needed to be transported within a city. And also it's oil free and very important that it's open source and we can do it ourselves. It doesn't require very high technology. We don't depend on a, on a, on a mine in, a, in, in a Central Africa, or on a mine in Asia. We don't depend on oil. We don't depend on a type of technologies where you need machines and this type of things. Most interesting, because I think it's also a question of technique, we try to rethink our economic model. We try to put back to re-embed economy, as Karl Polanyi said, that it's not the most important value in our community and our projects. The most important values is to put back conviviality, solidarity, sharing economy, uh, not uberization of the world, or the type of sharing economy, and um, also reciprocity economy to exchange services, knowledge, uh, to exchange solidarity in our everyday life and everything. And finally, uh, we have a lot of projects with education, with how to listen to each other, with nonviolent communication, with democracy, with autonomy, where the main question is first how to change ourselves, how to be able to be a citizen, enabled to live in a society, respecting the physical limits to growth, respecting the fact that if I start to consume more than one planet which is given to me, it means that I have to go to make wars to steal the planets from other people. And also how to step by step implement transition, which would be non-violent, which would be um, uh, democratic, toward new models of society. We don't know exactly how well they look like, but we try to experiment, construct them, and to go step by step in opening discussion and everything. And that's why we are also connected to research projects, political projects, and educational projects to connect with the children, different parts of the society, and everything. So with Cargonomia, what we do is nothing exceptional compared to what a lot of people are doing all around the world. But it's connected to degrowth. In a way that with degrowth, we keep questioning ourselves. And degrowth is very interesting because it's a provocative slogan. And I remember years ago, I had a discussion with somebody close to the sharing economy movement in France, doing a lot of wonderful things. And he didn't want to use the term degrowth, so I don't want to be so much associated to degrowth, what I respect. Because he said, I need good communication, I need something more inclusive. And years later, he regretted it, because sharing economy became uberization of the world, became exactly the contrary of the type of values that they were defending. So degrowth is here to be connected with a lot of different movements, with a lot of other type of approaches, ideas, and everything. And in a nonviolent way, in a, pro in a constructive way, to open discussion, to always question each other, to always question ourselves, that when I do something, whether it makes sense, what are the limits? Am, am I not falling into a wrong pathway, a wrong solution and everything? And also to question ourselves about what are the contradictions 
in every step what I do, because with Cargonomia we are also full of contradictions. We are learning, it's a work in progress. But a contradiction is not a problem, it's a problem only if you don't identify it, and if you don't try to work on it to somehow go above this contradiction and step by step implement even more transformation of the society. And also what we do with Cargonomia, we have a lot of uh, experimentation showing that uh, local solidar economy is very challenging within our economic model. So that's why we are connected to political movements, we are connected to a research movement to alert about the fact that we don't want to be subsidized to survive, but we want a first system where this type of desirable alternatives should be economically viable. So thank you for your, your attention and I am uh, more than happy to listen to your comments or questions. Magyarul lehet. So uh, it's exactly why I changed uh, the topic of my presentation. I would like to. I wanted first to develop more the second part, and I wanted to go back to the first part because uh, it's a very often a big lie we are taken in with green energy. You have everything, and it's contrary. For example, if green energy is to make low-tech solar thermal energy, what you can construct locally and everything, it's more or less renewable. But if it's green energy, it's a type of new type of energy with a lot of uh, um, a lot of IT things in it, with a lot of uh, high tech in it, and it's constructed with depending on a lot of uh, rare earths or metals, what you can find only in some part of the world, what you need more and more oil to extract, where you don't have the democratic control on it, and you don't really know what is the environmental impact, and it's not recyc recyclable because it's made in a way that it's not recyclable, it's very problematic. And it's what I wanted to do, it's to alert. And I think that the solution is not technological. The solution is really cultural and political. And um, we shouldn't put the horse in front of the carriage, uh, behind the carriage, because it doesn't go. We have to first question, what do we need? What are the basic needs? So what do we need to produce? And only after we can question how do we produce it. And as an engineer, I think the technical solutions are really not a problem. What the problem is that we always put the technique in the first, and after we depend on the technique, and we have a type of technique which is alienating us and not liberating us. And I, sh I show the example of the car in the United States in the 1970s, but it's the same with the smartphone nowadays. We started to have type of very, very, very powerful machines with a lot of services. We are only using a small part of these services, and we never really asked for that. I remember when I was a teenager, we didn't have mobile phone, and we didn't need mobile phone. We were able to meet with the friends and everything. And now when I meet with my friends, everybody's in front of the screen and is unable to communicate with each other and everything. So again, it doesn't mean that it's a bad tool, but it's very dangerous the way that it entered into our life without questioning, do we really need it? For what kind of services do we need it? And how to have a democratic control, how to have a human control of these technologies. Azt szeretném kérdezni, hogy egyetértenél-e azzal a gondolattal, és akkor, hogyha nem, akkor én is felkezdtem a ismeretében, hogy a növekedés kényszernek alapvetően két oka van, az egyik a népesség növekedés már ma van, a másik pedig a kamat intézménye, aminek megfizetéséhez, kamat megfizetéséhez mindig folyamatosan újabb és újabb örökkorásokat kell bevonni az so I agree with the second statement and not with the first one. The first one is a consequence of the, of, uh, of the second one. Sorry, but I think we invested um, interest in about 2,000 years ago that we uh, invested in 
In fact, population growth is very interesting. Last week I, uh, I was in a workshop in France where George Oskalis gave a talk about uh, Malthus. And Malthus was arguing for population growth in order to increase the economy. In order to, with that feeling that we need to produce always more, that modernity and development is coming with always more production, always more development, always more productivity and everything. And to do that we need demographic growth, and the best way to have demographic growth and to be able to feed always more people, it's to make the poor even poorer, because you put them in competition. And I think it's really driven with um, imaginary, starting with the first industrial revolution, with on one hand the belief, incredible crazy belief in always more, and also the competition between the nation, where economic uh, demographic growth was needed to always have more uh, people to send to the war and to fight and the competition between the countries and this race for always more and everything. And where well, I agree that it's uh, directly connected to uh, our economic model, which is based on uh, uh, interest, that you create money, you have an interest and you have to pay back this money, plus the interest. So you have to make the money always fruitful. And everybody is taken by this um, trap whether you grow or you die. So I think we have to totally rethink and to change our economic model. And that's why also I'm very skeptical with the idea to implement a transition within this economic model, even with a lot of nice projects which are launched and everything. That's why with Cargonomia we decided to start without making a loan because we don't want to be taken in this trap. And we were lucky now that uh, we had good connection to start without investing money, but on the contrary, investing on, on our um, solidarity and uh, on smart solutions and low-tech stuff and so on. And, and I think we have to tackle this question that till we have this economic model, moreover with the trap and the lie of the public debts, that in the name of the public debts we have to pay back the debts, so we have to destroy, like in Greece, education, solidarity, health and so on, we are taken in a crazy trap. And there maybe I can send you to our book when we develop a lot the story of uh, economics and solutions on, uh, uh, about economics, uh, how to reform economics to get rid of this type of trap and start to construct other worlds which will be based on different type of values and competition and always more. Just uh, one more point, I have some copies of the book uh, with me, some people are interested in, it's more, I mean, it's also about stories like Cargonomia, but it's mostly more about uh, uh, transition, because there was a question about it, how to implement transition on different levels and what could be the solutions to get rid of the trap we are taken with and to go to uh, new models of society based on uh, conviviality. So I have some copies with me, you can just come to me and it's 1,000 foreign per copies. Thanks a lot. It's Hungarian, person. Igen, Igen, magyarul tudtok tőle vásárolni a témáról könyvet. Um, Úgyhogy ezt szünetben meg is tehetitek. És egy közérdekű közlemény az esemény után, a szervezőkkel együtt a Dürer um, szórakozó helyen. Dürer kert tulajdonképpen a hivatalos neve, ott lesz egy kis bográcsozás, ahova Szeretettel várunk benneteket, tudtok csatlakozni, és akkor ott lehet tovább értekezni, beszélni, társalogni az elhangzott témákról és egyéb dolgokról, mint például, hogyha valaki szeretne részt venni a további szervezésben, vagy bekapcsolódna a projektbe. Thank you.